You're always wondering when it's going to come to light. He's here unlawfully. Government policy has invited them to be here. He's trying to short circuit the process and jump in the front of the line. It's terrible. It's really not a good way to live. Ever since I was 10 years old, my dream has been to become an attorney. Here I am at 35 and uh, that has not changed. Sergio Garcia is a mild-mannered, approachable guy. He grew up and still lives in the small town of Durham, California, where people know him by name. His mother and father even worked as farm workers in the area. In 2009, he passed the California State Bar, and if you ask him, it was a very big moment in his life. 22 years later, I had finally achieved my dream. It felt great. It was the best day of my life. But then things got complicated. The last group of people that needed to sign off on his license, the California Supreme Court, stopped short, saying that they needed to review the case a bit more. What tripped them up? Well, there's one more thing you should know about Garcia. He doesn't have documentation to live in the United States. You're always wondering when it's going to come to light. Like anything else that, uh, anything else that is personal, you don't go out there and meet, meet people and tell them, I'm Sergio Garcia, by the way, I'm undocumented. But Garcia wanted to tell the truth on his application for a license. The detail prompted the California Supreme Court to ask the U.S. Justice Department if granting Garcia a license would violate immigration law. The Justice Department said it would on the grounds that an unlawful alien doesn't have the right to work in the United States. The notion that we can give a license to practice law to somebody who cannot lawfully practice law under federal law is a bit bizarre. John Eastman is the former dean of Chapman Law School and doesn't think Garcia should receive a license. The law is very clear. It says that states cannot provide benefits to people who are illegally in the country, and it defines benefits to include professional licenses. But Garcia's story gets even more complicated. You see, he didn't choose to come to the U.S. on his own. Initially, at 17 months old, my parents brought me. I really can't tell you exactly how that went. I was here the first nine years of my life. And uh, at that point, in 86, that's when I traveled back to Mexico. Then he returned to Durham, California when he was 17 to finish high school. It was only then that his father told him about his status and helped him apply for a visa. Since then, he's been waiting for that visa to come in the mail, and now he's waiting for the state Supreme Court to decide what it's going to do. Listen to federal law or chart its own course. It's a decision that Eastman says has already been decided. Because under our Constitution, the power over immigration policy is vested with Congress that federal law prevails over anything the state might want to do. For Eastman, the answer is clear. He's here unlawfully. He's not gone back to his home country uh, and sought to apply like everybody else that waited in line in the home country. He's trying to short circuit the process and jump in the front of the line. I think if immigration law history were different from what it is, that that might be a reasonable view. Hiroshi Motomura is a law professor at UCLA and the author of the book, Americans in Waiting, The Lost Story of Immigration and Citizenship in the United States. Sergio Garcia's case is a very complicated one. There are a lot of factors going each way, but in the end, I would say that Sergio Garcia should be allowed to practice law. Motomura says that when you look at the details, Garcia is qualified to be in the U.S. He just doesn't have the documentation that says so. His status has a certain ambiguity to it, and the reason is that he is qualified to get permanent resident status in this country. He's qualified for what they call a green card, which means that you can stay in the country indefinitely and you're uh, eligible for citizenship after five years. And his qualifications go beyond being eligible for a visa. He has the approval of the State Bar Board of Examiners, he passed their positive moral character evaluation, and he's never committed a crime. He sounds like a wonderful individual, the kind of person many communities in Mexico might like to have to bolster their local economy. Eastman says that the State Bar's approval of Garcia's license comes down to politics. The California Bar's decision to support giving a law license to Sergio Garcia I think is more agenda-driven or politics-driven than, than law-driven. I think if they were to look more carefully at the laws that are on the books that, that have actually been passed by Congress, they would see that what they're doing is illegal. Motomura agrees, at least in part. There's a law that says it's a violation of federal law to hire someone who doesn't have permission to work. Someone who hires him would be uh, breaking a law if they hired him as an employee. What's not clear, though, is whether he can hang out a shingle and practice as a lawyer because there's an exception to that law that says you can be an independent contractor. So if you hire someone in the, in the loose sense of the word hire, they're not your employee. You hire them to handle a case or something like that, and that's not necessarily a violation of the law. If you're confused, you're not the only one. American immigration law is a maze of red tape, and since the turn of the century, it's been selectively enforced. We've had a history in this country where we have an immigration law that keeps a lot of people out. But ever since the early 20th century, enforcement has been selective, enforcement has been discretionary, 
For instance, take Garcia. Being deported given my status is a possibility, but it's highly unlikely. They would have already come and picked me up. They know where I live, they know my name, they know all my vital information. All that information is provided to them at the time of applying to adjust your status. Uh, they know exactly where I am and, and that just tells me that they feel that I'm a person that does not need to be removed from this country. Eastman says that when you don't remove people, you pay for it in other ways, namely in social welfare benefits. The draw on immigration to get access to those social welfare benefits is huge. And when you look at the costs, the costs in public education that the Supreme Court is required to be provided, the costs in emergency health care, uh, and compare that to the benefits that they may provide, I think the states that are saying, you know, this is costing us a lot more than we're getting are probably right. The federal government brings in a lot of revenue from people who are working in the country without papers. They pull it in through Social Security, they pull it in through income taxes. Undocumented workers are remarkably law-abiding with regard to paying taxes. While the Social Security Administration doesn't keep track of undocumented immigrants, they do keep track of W-2 federal tax forms that don't match up with real names or numbers in their system. They call it their earning suspense file. The suspense file says the administration collected $28.6 billion from 2008 to 2010 in uncredited taxes. We've allowed or tolerated, I think acquiesced in having 11, 12 million people in the country outside the law. That's been the situation for the least the last couple of generations since the mid-1960s. And the reason for that is we have an economic system that relies on undocumented labor. Even though people are in the country unlawfully, uh, the system, the economy, um, and, and government policies invited them to be here. So in that situation, it's not so simple to say, well, if you're in the country illegally, then we can basically treat you as badly as we want. That's the reason why the Supreme Court decided in 1982 that undocumented kids uh, have the right to go to school. That's the reason why courts in many situations recognize that people, even though they're here unlawfully, have rights, uh, rights in the workplace, uh, rights to fire protection, rights to marry, um, rights to certain um, public benefits. We don't take too kindly to people that cut in line at the movie theater. I'm not sure why we should do it and people that cut in line in order to get in, in the front uh, access to the United States and all of the wonderful benefits we provide. Motomura says the immigration line isn't like a movie theater line though, where everyone just waits their turn to get a ticket. There's no real line for a lot of people to stand in. Oh, or the line that they're made to stand in is much longer because of the country they're from. Garcia's on a very long wait list right now. Um, and that's another interesting thing because he's on a wait list, he's been qualified. The difficulty is that he's from Mexico and you have to wait longer if you're from Mexico, which is another thing about the system that's not often understood. It's true. According to State Department figures for the last year, the waiting list for Mexicans came in at almost 1.4 million, more than any other country. So if the immigration line is a line at all, it's more like a line where everyone stands side by side. Each immigrant has a different status, a different situation, a different story but each is hoping that someone else will make their dream come true. Independently of my status, I have to fulfill my dreams. I have to believe that all the work I have put into it is not gonna be in vain. The knowledge you learn, everything you gain up here is not dependent on a piece of paper. It's something you learn and something that will stick with you and help you throughout your life.